Anybody hear that? I'm fairly alarmed here. And welcome back to the Knights of Christendom. I'm your host, Frank, and I'm joined here with my good friend, Neil. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good, Frank. Nice to be with you again. Thanks a lot for joining me tonight. And, uh, you know, uh, Neil, one of the things that I've been running into a lot is people asking me questions about, you know, marriage, particularly in regards to when Catholics decide to marry, and not only non-Catholics, but Protestants, you know, specifically, because... You know, in America, it's funny. We have all these kinds of divisions, right? We have the left, we have the right, we have conservatives, we have liberals, we have, you know, racial divisions between black and white, we have gender divisions between men and women, we have sexual divisions between, you know, straights and gays. But for some reason in America, we've never really talked about religious differences. And I think the deeper you delve into sort of the collapse of American culture, the destruction of the family. I believe the divisions and the pluralism that's found, particularly at the American founding, the concept of American religious liberty, that, you know, we kind of got these, okay, abstract ideas, but you could do whatever you are, right? You do you, I do me. And as long as we uh, don't cross each other's property lines, we don't shoot each other. But I'll tell you, Neil, as I was growing up, the great divisions that I saw, again, from an anecdotal experience being, you know, living really the immigrant experience in many respects, and my parents being from the old country with old values, it was amazing to me when I first started going to school, grammar school, and then middle school, and then high school, how the divisions and the destruction of the family came because religious values were never taken seriously. From my experience, Neil, all the homes that where Catholicism was practiced devoutly by both husband and wife, those families stayed intact. But the moment Catholics deviated and married either nominal Catholics or Protestants even more so, there began the destruction of the family. I came from a community, Neil, that was primarily Italian, Croatian, and Hispanic, all solid Catholic communities. I saw very little familial destruction from those that came from the old world. But when I went to school, again, in grade school and then in high school, all my friends, or at least a lot of the kids that I went to school with that came from broken backgrounds, came from Protestant families. Neil, it's anecdotal, but I'm just telling you, that's my experience, my friend. Yeah, I think it's a symptom of religious indifferentism and a watering down of our Catholic faith. Because when we were held to our traditions and our uh, and held to the Catholic faith, a lot of times you know they didn't marry outside of their religious beliefs of, of the Catholic faith. They you know, we stuck with our own because of the warning that Saint Paul gave us in Second uh, Corinthians, where he says, uh, "Bear not the yoke with unbelievers." You know, and, and basically tell us not to be unequally yoked because that's going to cause problems. It's going to cause division. Someone in that relationship is going to be asked to abandon their belief. Yes. They're going to be asked to abandon doctrine at some point. Either the Catholic's going to do it or the non Catholic they marry is going to do it. But someone has to break down their deeply held religious beliefs. Basically, they, they're being asked to abandon the truth, uh, uh, you know, just plain out. And simple as that. And because of your attachment to this other person, you're more willing to compromise and to water down those beliefs because you love the person and you want to, yeah. you don't want to cause problems. You don't want to cause friction. That's one of the reasons you should marry someone who is de devoutly Catholic as yourself. So that there isn't this problem, this, this uh, conflict 
uh, that arises between different beliefs, different doctrines. You know, and this goes for even Catholics who are nominal Catholics. You know, you, you don't, it, that also is being unequally yoked because you got someone who's maybe a cafeteria Catholic. Well, you're going to be compelled to water down the faith once again, to get along. And that erodes the family at its core. Yes. Negotiable things. Yes. And because we're in America, we're in a Protestant nation and, and even more so a mixture of Freemasonry and this religious indifference. It's usually the Catholic that is asked to abandon his faith. And why is that? Because the church upholds the standard still, at least in its teachings, right? Where Protestantism waters everything down. And this is where we, we begin to see, again, the doctrinal, I guess, like watering down of, of a Catholic family. And, and Catholics have been asked to surrender their faith in that regard because, again, American religious liberty, personal moral codes, right? Let's just all get along. As long as we all follow the top 10 points of the faith, that's enough for us Americans here. We don't have to haggle over these, again, you know, sort of uh, these, uh, you know, ancient strict moral teachings that don't conform to our new economy and our new standards and a way of life. Uh, I'll give you the, the finest example of that contraception. It was done away with, with the Protestants starting in the 1920s, right? Catholics reaffirmed it in 1960, saying this is a great moral evil. Look where America's at today. The vast majority of Americans, including Catholics, think contraception is okay to practice, Neil. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's been universally accepted at this point. Uh, it not maybe not dogmatically within the church, yeah, but practically speaking, Catholics have embraced it as well. They're just as bad as non-Catholics, uh, and it's a tragedy, really, uh, uh, when it comes to contraceptives. And, right. But and, but it happened in a Protestant nation. That's the yeah. Thing. yeah. It started there. It started there. Yeah. But yeah. but we adopted it. Is my point. We took it on as well. We allowed it to infiltrate well, us. I yeah, I think, too, as historian Charles Coloma said, we were willing to water down our own Catholic faith in order to get along. Because yeah. I think if we go down the strict sort of path of what Catholicism has been traditionally, there's a contradiction there with some American values. And rather than us fighting and converting Protestants, we decided to water down, again, certain dogmatic issues in order to get along in America and, and, and hence, this is why I argue America now culturally is a rotten pile of manure, why the family has been destroyed. You know, I mean, there's many examples we can give, right, starting in the 1960s. But I think, you know, just in general, to, to, to highlight big events, Protestants caving in on contraception starting in the 1920s, 1930s. It ultimately leads to, to the sexual revolution because the moment you don't have that fear of getting pregnant anymore, Contraception leads really to the revolution uh, of, of sexual liberation. And that's what we see in the 60s following, again, the pill being made over the counter in 1961. You see a whole, a whole rash of sexual sins all of a sudden collapse within Protestantism and Catholics eventually follow in order to fit in and accommodate in the Protestant nation. Yeah, I would, I would also argue that contraception leads to what we're having today with homosexuality and yeah. transgenderism because it breaks the link between marriage and sex and uh, procreation. And if there's no procreation, if, that's not, if that link isn't there, then it's only about coupling. And if it's yes. only about coupling, then who has to care if it's two guys, two girls, a guy who thinks he's a girl, what's it matter at that point anymore? Because it's no longer about life. It's so long about procreation. We've broken the link. And so we've allowed all these other immoral disordered behaviors to come in because why not, right? It's no longer about uh, having children. It's no longer about that. It's just about, well, how do you feel about this? Other yeah, exactly. And, and, and really that's why we go through a 1960s sexual revolution. And, and here we are with a bunch of moral, social, and cultural disorders, and nobody knows how to get a hold of this, ironically enough, right? And, and that's the interesting part. You think, as Americans, in this realm of logic, reason, rationalism, we go back to the past and say, okay, where did it go wrong? 
But we don't do that. Not even the political right does that, right? Because I think the dirty little secret here is, is that while the far left progressives have been looking to take the culture uh, to the far left, uh, have been leading the way in many respects, that, uh, you know, uh, f- help facilitating destruction of the family, the political right, they kind of like their sins too. They may not go as far as the left, Julian, I'm sure, excuse me, excuse me, Neil, but they like their sins just as much as the left. And I think this is why we have a problem with looking back at the past, right, and saying that, okay, this is where things went wrong. No, all we get is freedom, liberty, freedom, liberty. And essentially, you look at the Republican Party today, what are they? They're a bunch of, they're a bunch of libertarians for the most part. Nobody even fights on the social front anymore. Neil? Well, yeah, because they bought into the whole separation of church and state as well. It's not, they want religion to be in your own little private little home, yeah. and that's it. You stay there in your little corner. And the problem is, when it comes to social problems, like like the homosexuality, like abortion, like contraception, all of that has to have a morality based in our religion. And now all of a sudden, it's to, to follow that, you've got to go out into the public sphere, and neither side likes that. They, they, they don't like it. They want you to keep it private and away from everything else. Yeah. But the problem is when you do that, you break down the family, you break down society. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and there you go. And so when we start talking about Catholics marrying outside the church, and, and, and there's a simple prescription that I have really um, when it comes to that. And I tell people all the time that, that ask me this question, what do I think of that? I said, listen, the history of Christianity and the West is quite really simple. The further away man deviates away from the church and the sacraments, the more social chaos we have in our society. And I apply that to the micro as well as the macro, right? If you are a Catholic and you're thinking about marrying a Protestant, the first perception that I have and what I believe most likely is the case that you're a nominal Catholic as it is. But just like any other relationship, the further you drift away from the church, the more disordered any relationship is going to be. If you drift away from the church and the sacraments, you will have disorder with your children. You will have disorder with your parents. You will have disorder with your co-workers. There's, there's, this is why we have all this family dysfunction that is widespread now. You're asking me here, what is the problem with a Catholic marrying a Protestant or the non-religious? Look at the society. Look at the culture. Look at what's happened to our civilization as it's drifted further and further away from the church and from the sacraments. It all becomes disorder. Well, yeah, because the very basis of your relationship is disunity. You're not unified. Exactly. On a very core issue that is religion that is what does jesus uh teach and how do we follow jesus christ these are yeah. very serious issues mm-hmm. you know that, that are uh, formed in our doctrines and our dogmas you can't but, just throw these aside and exactly. when you start relationship with someone who is completely opposite of the doctrines that jesus christ has taught then you're not unified as a, as a couple Okay, okay, but, Neil, what if two people meet, they have the chemistry, and they fall in love, but they happen to be from two different religions? What do you do with love, man? Can you say no to love? Well, you see, that's why you need to, dis- you need to uh, discuss this before you fall in love. <laughs> the first conversation you need to have is what is your religious belief before your hearts get entangled with each other. People today, when they go to date, they don't even think about discussing important issues first up. Number one, your first date, your first communication should be, what do you believe about salvation? You know, what is our religious beliefs? I believe this. Well, that's not going to work. The only, and once again, someone's going to have to compromise. So if you're going to continue in that relationship, that person would have to promise to raise the kids Catholic. So you're asking them to abandon what they strongly believe at that point. Yeah. Some are willing to do that. There are some cases who want to do that. But that's what you're asking them to do, to do in that situation. If you think that's fair, then you have, and that's, that's okay to ask them to do that, uh, then continue in your relationship. Mm-hmm. Personally, 
I don't necessarily think it's it's fair to that person to say, hey, you know those deeply held beliefs you have? Go ahead and toss them out the window and do what I say. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you, you know, hey, you know what? I'm going to go with someone who's Catholic like me. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you say that because when I was single and dating, I actually got advice. Well, people try to give me advice. They knew I was very political, things like that. They said, you know, Frank, on a first date, you're going out with this girl. Never talk about politics or religion. And I'm like, oh, OK, interesting. When I met my wife, very first time we went out, the very first conversation we had was about faith and religion. My wife was a Protestant. I was a Catholic. It was a very first com- it was a very civilized conversation. She was curious to understand what I believe. I was curious to understand about what she believed. And I think it was very important. We got that out the way uh, initially to see if we could you know, move forward in many respects, because th- those values actually matter. I know from my part, you know, while I struggled and was kind of a nominal Catholic for many years, dogmatically, I was solid. And I knew that I could never get married outside the church. It wasn't a compromise. Was I, compromise I was willing to make. This is my own for my own personal self, because my faith to me, I knew was everything. And that I knew intrinsically that I married a non-Catholic, that those conflicting values would eventually come into play. And so, you know, somebody said, well, didn't you love your, 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 your girlfriend, which would be your wife? Of course I loved her, of course. But I love God more. And I expect her to love God before she loves me. Because if the woman you marry or the man you marry puts God first before you, that's a pretty solid candidate to know that the values that they hold dear are time-tested principles that will guide that marriage or that relationship through the murkiest of times. And it is the ultimate in selflessness. I mean, I went through this very test, and this is why I bring up this, this conversation tonight, because there's many Catholics out there that are willing to sacrifice everything in the name of love. And here we are in America in 2022, you look around and the culture has gone to a hell in a handbasket. Nothing makes sense. Everything that was once right is now considered wrong. Everything that was once considered evil is now considered good. It doesn't make sense. And we've had this religious indifferentism, this Protestant Freemasonic mashup in America for the past 250 years. And the supposed political ideology, the political right, who supposedly stands for religious principles, has no idea how to tell us how to get the genie back in the bottle at this point in history. They're they're flaming out with cockamamie ideas like, you know, Dennis Prager, let's make the Bible the book of America again. Listen, the Bible's always been the book of America, okay? If you guys understood that Solo Scriptura has always been a failure since the Protestant Reformation, we we, we wouldn't regurgitate such disastrous ideas that have led us here. Neil? Yeah, and like I said before, the the religious principles of the right is religious indifferentism. Yeah, it's, I mean that that's where they're just as bad as the left. That where they want to just say, "Well, believe whatever you want. Now, if it's false, that's okay. That's okay too. Do that. Do you do you? I'll do me, and we'll just." And it's like it has no understanding of truth. Error does not have rights. The truth does. The truth has rights. Okay, you do not have a right to preach error. To just do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. And the right doesn't understand that. And no. that's why the right is so damn confused when they see the world going crazy and they don't know what to do about it. <laughs> and it all starts at the familial level. It all starts with the, the problems brought on by contraception. Eventually, that leads to the divorce problem. Eventually, that leads to the abortion problem. Eventually, that leads to the disorder problem. Eventually, that leads to the gender euphoria problem that we're being consumed by today. And who has the answer here? Nobody. Just go out and vote and vote harder. Oh, but wait a minute. Those candidates we vote for never stand for the principles we believe in, that we fought for. I keep hearing from the right. Let's go fight. We got to fight. We got to fight. That's all we've been doing. Is fighting. And even when we win, we wind up losing because the problem is we have disorder at the familial level because we've never gotten true principles, first principles straight in this country. And when you got the likes of a a Glenn Beck preaching covenant theology, take a piece of paper like I got right here. See right here. Right. Write down your top 10 points of the faith. This is what I believe, God. And I sign it and I hang this on my wall. God has to honor 
that covenant, what I wrote down, that promise that I made to God, which I'll go back to what I've been saying for a while. And a lot of people think I'm crazy, but I believe that many conservatives believe that the Constitution of the United States actually supersedes the divine laws of God. When you believe in a covenant theology where you could constantly rewrite the terms of condition like the likes of Glenn Beck and that one actor, Kirk Cameron, have been preaching lately, you're telling me God is submissive to your will. There is one covenant. It was established 2,000 years ago. You abandoned it because of immorality. The very thing we're talking about here now, the very things that are destroying the family, you guys didn't like that for sexual license, starting with Luther. And if you go down the path of the Enlightenment, sexual license was all over the Enlightenment. It was all over the Protestant Reformation, and it's all over our politicians today, including the Enlightenment thinkers. You don't get away from the problems of our civilization, the destruction of the culture, the political destruction, and the, and really the destruction of the family without taking into account the, 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 the sexual and moral disorders of the people that have gotten us here, the first of which was abandoning Holy Mother Church. Yeah, and that, you know, you mentioned all that, and that reminds me of uh, Sean Hannity. You know, who I've recently heard on the radio saying how he why he left the church and how he distrusts all organized religion, you know, but he sure as heck doesn't distrust the organized religion of Americanism. He sure holds on to that. Yeah, he'll abandon Holy Mother Church. OK, and it's that is just an image of how the right is right now yeah. when it comes to religion versus the church and how we see the destruction of the family as well. Mm -hmm. It's just, well, I'll do my own thing because I don't trust any organized religion. I'm going to, I'm God now. I get to decide this right and wrong. But of course, the sacred writings of the founding fathers, on the other hand, are infallible. That's our Bible. We trust that uh, without any question. But when it comes to the truth of Jesus Christ in his Roman Catholic Church, well, of course, I get to just make it up as I go. I get to decide. I get to choose. That once again, that's the religious indifferentism that is espoused by both the right and the left. You know what I found out recently about Sean Hannity, Neil? Yeah. Right around the time he abandoned his Catholic faith, he got a divorce from his marriage, from his wife. Really? I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. He's a divorcee. Yeah. And well, that's interesting. because. Okay. Go ahead. That goes hand in hand with it. He divorced the church. Now he divorced his marriage. Yeah. See, see, that's that's the thing. That's the thing. Divorce. Divorce is the ultimate, really the ultimate concept of Protestantism. Right. Luther, Henry, Calvin, they divorce from the church. So divorce naturally becomes um, really that thing that 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 found finds Protestantism in many ways. And, and this is why the Protestants have never fought to the nail against divorce and remarriage in this country. And that's why classical liberals say, well, you don't want to be stuck in a horrible marriage. Right. Freedom, liberty. Again, conservatives would argue that the right to divorce, a public divorce, supersedes the law of God, which specifically condemns divorce and remarriage in the Bible because fr the freedom and liberty of the founders is greater divine truth than the Bible itself. And Protestants help facilitate that again right around the turn of the century, right after the Industrial Revolution as contraception is becoming more popular, pornography is being uh, made more you know, readily available, and divorce and remarriage Protestants were not arguing against that at a certain point. And how could you, especially if you're like from the Church of England, where you have a church founded on divorce with King Henry VIII, just to start with, Neil? Yeah, and I, I find Protestants have a belief in divorce. They believe that, it, that there is a, an acceptable reason for divorce, especially the spouses cheating on you. Um, while in the church, in the Catholic church, divorce doesn't really exist. You're either married or you never were married. That's right. It's not, there's no, you got married, then the marriage is dissolved. Annulment says that the marriage was never valid to begin with. So we have a very different view on marriage and divorce. Yes, because freedom and, and liberty, freedom and liberty issues. supersedes the laws of Christ, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. 
So, you know, it, it's it's just one of these things where, you know, we're all complaining about the destruction of the culture, the destruction of the family, which leads to the destruction of the political system. You know, I, one of the things I'm hearing right now, uh, Neil, is, is conservatives talk about we just have a bad class or uh, we have bad leadership at this moment in history right now. That That's our biggest problem right now. And I'm thinking to myself, you got you got the family in a state of disarray. You got the culture is a flaming pile of crap. Why wouldn't you think that would lead to bad leadership at the top of our our government? It's a byproduct. It all flows from one another. Neil. Yeah, well, I mean, you're not going to fix anything when the people on the right are so accepting of these disordered lifestyles. They're, well, I don't care what you do in your private bedroom. Just don't push it on everybody. Excuse me? Live in sin? Have disordered lives? We'll go out to dinner with you and pretend like it's normal? But just as long as you don't push it on, on us in schools or whatever. Why wouldn't they push it if it's normal? Yeah. If that is a normal, natural relationship, then why shouldn't it be taught to kids? You can't have it both ways. Either it's disordered and evil, and it shouldn't be taught to kids and, and schools, and it shouldn't be pushed in our society, or it's normal and acceptable. You know, I, this reminds me of uh, when that Dave Rubin character came out with having a, a kid, you know, through in vitro fertilization, this kind of thing. People on the right were congratulating him. Why? Because he agrees with them politically. Yeah. Well, if you're going to accept that behavior, you can't then turn around and say, well, well, you shouldn't push that kind of behavior on society. Well, you just said it was okay. You congratulated him. Yeah. So you can see that he needed to. And Glenn Beck was the first to congratulate him, by the way. Yeah. I saw the interview. Uh, that's the interesting thing about it, right? Um, so, and so this is where we're at, um, uh, Neil. Um, I, I just, I guess what I want to convey from this show is that everything that is happening right now, you know, like right now, we're, we're talking about, what's it called, pronoun issues. We're talking about, you know, gender dysphoria, all these other issues that the right claims to be fighting against right now. Trust me, if, if history is a pattern of how the right has dealt with these problems, they'll eventually surrender like they surrendered on abortion, a contraception, and, you know, everything that, you know, since the sexual revolution, you know, the country has embraced as new moral norms, eventually the right will surrender here too. Um, they're trying right now. They're trying right now. But as soon as it doesn't become politically convenient anymore or a, a winnable issue at the polls, the right will surrender. And, and this leads me again to, you know, somebody asked me the other day, Neil, when did the right really start surrendering on socialism? When did this sort of libertarian, libertarian-esque, libertine sort of flavor of the Republican Party and the conservatism really start? Oh, I said, that's easy. That was during the Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton affair. The Republicans went to impeach him, right? Now, they'll, they'll say that it was over, you know, lying and, you know, to the grand jury and things like that. But let's be honest. When that affair broke, the public in America never saw a problem with a president basically sleeping with the, an inferior employee, you know. The, the, the lower status employee. Yeah. And the country as a whole, after, again, 30 years of the sexual revolution and the broken families playing a role, didn't see a problem with that affair. And it was that moment that Republicans said, it's over. Let's just focus on economics. The Republicans never recovered from that on social issues. And this is why you've seen Republicans, conservatives, really cave in on one moral issue after another uh, Neil, this is where we're at. Yeah, there was a time when the the right fought against sex education in schools. Yeah. Well, they've given up on that completely. Oh yeah. You don't, they don't care about that. Go ahead, <laughs> teach. Them, like I said, just don't teach them homosexual stuff, right? Right. Well, it's gonna. Well, as we move for along, okay. Well, we'll let that happen. Uh, just don't teach them uh, something else. You know, they're right. gonna give up ground each time, and they're gonna allow this stuff to happen. Every time, because they, they're just going to shut up about it at some point. They're going to give up because they don't really have a objective moral compass. They have political ends. They have yeah. political objectives, and that's all they want. They're, they're reading polling numbers. They're reading polling numbers. That's all they do. Exactly. They're just as bad as the left when it comes to that because all they want is power. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, it's... Don't tell me it's a republic when they act like it's a democracy. They want the poll number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, the problem is, is that I think many conservatives are principled, and they'll tell you privately these things are wrong. The problem is democracy in itself. They don't know how to govern outside democracy, right? It's like I had a friend of mine when we started Knights of Christian I'm here, you know, and we started criticizing democracy in the Western Republic and the Enlightenment. Say, listen, Frank, you know, you're wasting your time here. America is never going to be a Catholic nation, right? We have to work with the system that we have. But the system that we have has given us the pile of crap we're all living through now. Neil? Yep. Yeah, see? the system we have to the left. Yeah. It's, so I, I don't, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword here. And so, listen, if you're telling me we have to vote to manage the decline, okay. I guess I still go to the polls. I still vote, but can can we be, you know, honest about certain things here? Listen, I'm watching Tucker tonight, right? I'm watching Tucker, and his story was about the state of Utah, where I live, and how this conservative state, and Utah's one of the most conservative states in the country, right? We're electing leftist Republicans here that are some of the most woke politicians you can imagine. And Tucker's asking, well, how does that happen? How does a conservative state, a religious state, if you look at, if you study Utah, they have, you know, a lot of kids out here, right? Very conservative, hate government, love their guns here, very conservative. How do we get all these elected leaders that are so woke and really left of center as Republicans? He was dumbfounded by it. And my answer to that has always been simple. Listen, democracy spreads like cockroaches here, right? You, you're always going to have leftist institutions, leftist influence, leftist money that comes in even into the red states in order to influence that particular state. Look how the left hijacked Colorado about two decades ago. Look how the left took Virginia off the map. This is how leftists and democracy more than anything else works. Because you know what? Being woke nowadays in, in the midst of this millennial generation now that is being raised and really the first generation ever raised without any formal catechesis in the faith, they believe in this woke stuff. If you're a politician, that's how you get elected in America, Neil. Yeah, and you know, the, the, what the left is not afraid to do that the right is afraid to do is evangelize. The left is going to push their message nonstop. They're going to boycott. They're going to cancel people. They're going to protest. They're going to push it into the schools, into political life, into our social lives. They're going to push and push and push. While Meanwhile, those on the right go, well, why do I want to force my beliefs on nobody? I don't want to push nothing on nobody. That's not right. That's not how you win people's hearts and minds. BS. That's exactly how you win hearts and minds. You push it. You push and push and push. Yeah. Because that's why the left is winning. Yeah. Yeah. It's freedom, baby. Freedom. That's what the right believes in. And it's, it's a you fought for, <laughs> defend, pushed, evangelized. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is where we're at. This is the nuttiness that is America in 2022. And these right wingers are scratching their heads. What happened to America? What happened to America? Well, a lot of us warned you a long time ago that we were headed down this path, you know, especially with a lot of these social issues. You know, this this quasi libertarian thing that's being pushed. Let's just focus on economics. And the irony of it all is here, is Neil, is that the middle class is being crushed now at this point in history. The economics isn't even working out to, 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 to a large scale. So anyway, listen, we've gone off on a political rant here on top of what we started. And that was, you know, Catholics marrying non-Catholics. And, and I guess to wrap it up, um, my question for you, Neil, is. If a family member of yours or a, a friend of yours comes to you and says, listen, I'm going to marry such and such, she's a Protestant or she's non-religious and things like that, what would you say to that individual? Well, in that particular instance, I think it's too late to, uh, to talk about, well, you should be equally yoked uh, because they're already, they're already at that point where they want to marry and this kind of thing. They're already involved with each other. Uh, so the only thing they can do is, okay, are you going to raise the kids Catholic? Yeah. Are you going to stick to your Catholic beliefs? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to water yourself down? 
are you going to uh, water down the truth? And your kids. You know? and, and thus your kids, whatever kids you have, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're already in a very hard place to be in at that point. That's why it needs to be caught early, early on. You need to talk about your religion and politics early on before you're entangled. Because once your your hearts are wrapped up in each other, you're not going to listen to reason. You're not going to listen to the truth because you you feel so strongly for this person. You know, you have to remember when you go into relationships, it's not about how I feel necessarily for this person, but rather it's about life. How am I going to have a family with this person? How am I going to raise these children? How are we going to build uh, our, our life together, uh, our spiritual life together? You know, what are our beliefs? You kind of cover that first yep. uh, before you start how you start getting your emotions wrapped up into it. So if yeah. a person came to me in that situation, the, the only thing I could tell them is you better know your faith really well and make it very clear to how you want to raise the kids because it's going to be an issue. Yeah. In other words, Catholic marriages matter. They do. Yes. <laughs> That's the bottom line. And, you know, for my part, um, you know, I know lots of nominal Catholics that really don't pay attention to church issues. My advice to them is, is that you get married to a Protestant. You know, you have already watered down the faith. Um, you marry a Protestant or non-religious, you're going to continue to dissolve whatever it is, whatever moral standards that are necessary to function properly as a well-ordered individual. And um, I, I think that's that's a massive problem. Uh, listen, dating... Um, the Google Gaga fuzzy feelings of love, and in, in most cases now the lust and the and the, and the, and the sexual s- sensationalism because everybody's doing it now. Obviously, um, that dies down, and when you get married, and kids start coming in, you know what? Things get real. Things get real, and um, it's not going to be the act in the bedroom or the warm fuzzies that's going to keep that marriage strong and vibrant. It's going to be faith. It's going to be your values um, so that you don't not only hurt each other, but walk out on each other. Because if you if you don't have those strong, again, beliefs in eternal truth, those dogmatic beliefs of and faith in God, it's easy to walk away when things get tough. And I think we see a direct correlation between the great apostasy, the great loss of faith that we're living through over the past 60, 70 years, and the divorce rate skyrocketing in that same period. It's not a coincidence that they coincided together. And it's because we've had a loss of faith. And with a loss of faith comes a loss of principles, morality, and really the bedrock sort of spiritual and even emotional and rational bedrock of any marriage of any relationship and any family. Neil, my friend, I wanna thank you for joining me tonight. Fantastic conversation as usual, my friend. Thank you for having me again. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Frank. Uh, Once again, I wanna thank my good friend, Neil, for joining me tonight. We're signing off for the Knights of Christendom. Good night, everybody.